Okay, thanks very much for having me here to talk about our human genome sequencing efforts. Um, so before I dive into the million data that we generated, I would like to go back a little bit because we have been working on uh, structural variations in human genomes for quite a while already. <coughs> um, so they come in many different flavors, as you can see here, uh, and I like the complexity of all of this. So the human genome in that sense is, is a very nice object of study. Um, and all these different types of structural variations uh, also pose uh, challenges in terms of, in terms of their detection. Um, so in the earlier days, uh, when I started working in, the, in this area, um, we used uh, actually a, a, a technique which is called paired end mapping. It's, it's basically the straightforward paired end luminous sequence that most of you should be familiar with. But there's variations on this team as well. Uh, so earlier on, we also generated many of these so-called uh, mate pair libraries or jumping libraries as you wish and they allow you actually to generate um, libraries uh, for luminous sequencing with very long inserts so where the two ends that you sequence actually span uh, very long distances become because they come from originally very long uh, long molecules so this was a very efficient way uh, to map um, <coughs> genomic structure variations at the time i should say though that you always needed kilos of dna uh, to, to do this library preps and a lot of patience because it took around a week or so to prepare a single sample for, for sequencing. Um, but nevertheless, it was very efficient and you can see on the, on the right side here um, how you could use this technology to map all kinds of different structural variations in, the, in your data. <coughs> so we, we've used this, this mate pair technology, this jumping libraries to uh, sequence uh, um, several human genomes with uh, chromosomal rearrangements. At some point we noted in, in our diagnostics laboratory, labor laboratory in our institute uh, some patients with, a, with an aberrant karyotype that you can just visually see under the microscope. And then we thought let's just apply this jumping library technique and see whether we can find more than you just see with your bare eyes under, under the microscope. <coughs> and basically when we did this and mapped all the data to the reference genome, and this is just one example of them, actually of the, of the karyotype that I just uh, showed to you in the previous slide. Then we saw very complex chromosomal rearrangements. Uh, so this plot nicely illustrates this. It basically uh, tells you that there are three chromosomes that are infected in this, in this, in this patient, uh, all de novo breakpoints. Um, and the lines here that connect all the different chromosomal coordinates basically represent uh, breakpoint junctions. So this is my alternative way of, of, of these circle plots that you very often see in, uh, in papers. Uh, so to be able to make sense of the data, when we for first saw this, we thought it's extremely complex. How can we really find out what the chromosomal structure is of these patients? Um, and actually, when we thought a little bit further about this, it's actually very straightforward given, given these data. Um, so this is just an example of how we uh, kind of e eventually got to the genome structure in these patients. So you see these balls, and they basically connect all the breakpoint junctions and then go on toward the ends of the chromosome. So some of the uh, resulting chromosomes from this very chromotrypic process are not very difficult, or are not very complex, but some are actually very complex. So the final chromosomal structure that we obtained from this um, is shown here. So three chromosomes involved, uh, as, as already, already was noted from the karyotype, uh, which is shown, uh, shown again here. One of them is very complex, contains many different pieces of chromosomal DNA stitched together, forming these new derivative chromosomes in such a patient with obvious consequences for the, for, for the clinic, for the phenotype of the patient. So this, this, this phenomenon is known as chromotrypsis. Uh, this was actually also discovered in cancer cells. We discovered this in geno genomes of patients with uh, congenital disease. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting uh, and spectacular phenomenon uh, underlying human, human diseases. <coughs> so um, we have used, used several technologies over time to look at human genomes and always when you use a different angle or a different method or a different bioinformatic approach, you start to see different things. So we were very excited uh, about a year ago to put some serious efforts into um, um, nanopore sequencing as an alternative way of looking at uh, a genome structure. Um, so my colleague, Ivo Rankins here, is uh, very dedicated to nanopore sequencing these days. So he's been doing a lot of sequencing runs, uh, learning how to use the instrument, uh, really having a very steep learning curve over time and also seeing the many, many changes that we uh, have, have seen over, over the last year or so. <coughs> so uh, we started sequencing a single human genome. Um, 
um, and we thought it would be appropriate to sequence a genome with such a very complex rearranged chromosome, this chromotrypsis. Uh, so this is the patient that we sequenced. Again, these data were generated by Illumina sequencing, and now we started sequencing the same uh, sample um, using Nanopore. So we started sequencing in April uh, 2016. Uh, we used native DNA extracted from blood and also from uh, renal kidney cells obtained from urine of this patient, which we could actually culture to obtain a bit more uh, DNA and some fresh source of DNA, uh, because we really needed a lot of DNA to get all of this done at the time. So uh, in April, we still started with, with some R7 chemistry in our very first runs. Then later on, we switched to R9. And finally, we topped it off with, with some R9.4 flow cells as well. Uh, we typically did some uh, mild shearing in, in G-tubes. We have used various flavors of protocols uh, over time as well. Uh, in some cases, we used uh, size selection using the pippin. In some cases, we didn't. Also, to get a bit of a feeling what, what works and what does not work. So in that sense, it was a, was a test case overall. So after a few months, weeks or months of sequencing, um, somewhere in September, we did around 90 runs in total, R7, R9, R9 and we reached, uh, well, just below 10x uh, genome-wide coverage of this, this sample with chromotrypsis. Um, then only a few weeks later, we saw this announcement on the website of e ONT, um, where actually they demonstrated more or less the same amount of data with only five runs, so, well, let's say 20 times less than we, uh, than we had used, so I'm not sure whether we were really discouraged or encouraged by these data. But anyway, we went on doing some further sequencing using the R9.4 data as well, um, and finally stopped, uh, sorry, uh, finally stopped uh, sequencing uh, in around mid-November or so, where we had reached the 16x coverage of, of this genome, and then we thought it's time for, to do some meaningful analysis with these data. Um, well, as you can see, I mean, 122 runs is quite a lot, of course, um, doesn't mean that we are totally bad at, at, at nanopore sequencing. We have also done some very good R9.4 runs uh, these days. So this is one of, the, I think, the most successful ones, where we also sequence the native DNA sample, so different sample, by the way, uh, reached about three gigs uh, total data, one the uh, rapid uh, prep. And uh, I think uh, very happy with this. So now we can, of course, uh, reach the same coverage much faster than we did, uh, than we did before. So we first looked at some some you know, sequencing spec, uh, specs of these data, uh, like read-linked profiles, which I won't show now. Uh, I think very interesting is, is this uh, GC bias plot, um, so the coverage distribution affected by the GC bias. And here we compared actually Illumina data for this sample, uh, compared it to the, to the Nanopore data of the same sample. And you see that there's much less bias in general um, for GC or high G or low C GC rich regions. Um, when you compare nanopore to, uh, to Illumina. Oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, I think. Oh, it's up and under. Good. Um, so we really focused on detecting structural variations from these data. And um, actually, there's not much tools out there yet to do this from, from, uh, from such large data sets. So we thought, let's build our own tool. It's actually quite straightforward here. So this, this slide basically shows the basic concepts of this tool. Uh, in essence, it's a, uh, a tool that detects split mappings in reads. So we used LAST for the mapping uh, uh, for, these, for these human sequencing data, uh, then looked at these split segments, did a clustering across many reads uh, for any position where there was a split in the mapping. And then finally, we uh, outputted the VCF file with locations where breakpoints might happen in, uh, in the sequences that we obtained. So this is a nice example, a screenshot of one of these chromotrypsis breakpoints. There were four, 40 in total in this patient. Um, and I think you can nicely see where the reads are split mapped. And this is really the breakpoint position, reads coming from this end and also coming from the other end because it's a double-stranded DNA break. And those segments are then fused to other segments in the genome, which you don't see, see in this, uh, this screenshot right now. So, we asked ourselves the question, how many of these de novo chromotrypsis breakpoints can we actually identify? Uh, so this is shown in this plot. Uh, so with, uh, with the Illumina data that we had generated in the first place, we could capture 40 breakpoints. We validated those independently by PCR assays, using the parents along to make sure that they're really authentic and de novo calls. Uh, then this is what we obtained with our own uh, NanoSV uh, structure variation caller. So basically, we could capture all of the variants that we uh, identified already in the Lumina data. 
as the NOVA calls in, these, in this uh, nanopore sequencing data. We also tested some other colors. Lumpy, I think, not perfectly suited for the nanopore data, but we anyway tested this just as a benchmark. Um, and also Sniffles, which is a tool that is, I think, not published yet, but at least uh, available online, um, which could also capture most of the data, but not all. Another question that we ask ourselves is, um, if we go genome-wide and not focus only on these chromotrypsis rearrangement, what can we get in, uh, in this data? Uh, so actually, we pulled out all possible uh, structure variation colors from the shelf that we could uh, get a hand of to call structure variations in the Illumina data in the first place, as you see here. So these are the five different colors that we use, which can capture many different flavors of structure variations in these Illumina data. And then we thought, let's see what nanopore sequencing data can add to this. Uh, so we used actually the, the three different um, colors for the nanopore data and compared uh, the, the call sets uh, across all the different col colors that we generated. Um, and you can see here that there's actually many data that are specific to nanopore. There's also a substantial amount of data that are overlapping uh, between many different call sets, both Illumina and nanopore, uh, and some only overlap between um, call sets which were generated from nanopore data only. So we did some uh, serious validation analysis to find out how many of these uh, circulation calls, which are just predictions, of course, in the first place, are, are really valid. Um, so actually, you can see here that for the calls that are overlapping between both Illumina data sets and nanopore data sets, there is a very high um, accuracy there, so we could validate most of those uh, variations uh, within, this, uh, within, within this window. Uh, so if we go on to the variations that are actually overlapping between one, two, or three uh, circular variation colors that were only uh, uh, run on the, uh, on the nanopore data, then the validation rates uh, dropped quite considerably. We're still actively looking at this. There's still a number of, of good variants in there, uh, and, and you should realize that these are really thousands of variants in this, uh, in this window here. Uh, but we should still tweak the parameters a little bit to make sure we get a high consensus uh, call set from this. And the same is actually true for the data that we on only could capture by our own SV color here, also around 30 to 40 percent uh, validation rate. So there's, there's still a hat for, uh, for improvement there. So let's just take a, a look at a few of these uh, nanopore specific structure variation calls that we identified using this, these methods in the, in the data that we obtained. Uh, so here, you see a screenshot from IGV from a, from a deletion that is very obvious from the nanopore data here below, uh, but not so clear from the Illumina data. And actually, it was in known of the uh, Illumina call sets that we generated here. Here, another example of a duplication. It's, I think, quite obvious that this is a very difficult region to map reads to, in the Illumina at least. Um, nanopore didn't seem to have, seem to have problems here, and uh, we could nicely call a tandem duplication in, in this area here. I think another piece of evidence to show that indeed there is some valuable information in those nanopore specific variations uh, that we identified here and that, that is shown by this plot, which basically shows you the uh, sizes of insertions that we detected in these nanopore specific holes. Uh, so you nicely see uh, here a peak appearing, which is actually due to uh, sign insertions in the human genome, which are known to be, to be very prevalent in, in human genomes. OK, so the next question, besides just structure variation calling that we ask ourselves, is about uh, phasing of genetic variations. Uh, because the long reads of the nanopore are, of course, very suited for this. So we ask ourselves the question, can we phase the structure variations that we discovered in the first place in these data? Uh, so how we did this is actually we cheated a little bit because we also used the Illumina data alone uh, to start the phasing process. Uh, so we had the whole trio sequence in this case, so the, both the patients with chromotrypsis, but also the father and the mother. Uh, so using this trio information uh, from the Illumina data, I should say, we obtained 1.7 mil million genetically phased SNPs in this kit with chromotrypsis and used these to phase the nanopore reads to split them in father and mother bins, as you can see in this plot over here. So these reads on this side, uh, are, the, are the reads from the father, and these reads on this side are reads from the mother, uh, and the numbers indicate different SNPs, numbers of SNPs within each of these read sets. Uh, then we took a set of, of uh, structural variations that overlap between Illumina and Nanopore data. There were uh, just over 2,000 of them, um, and we did genetic phasing of these SVs as well using the Illumina Trio data to, to obtain a ground, th ground truth set. 
uh, and then actually we, fa we face these SVs as well by the nanopore reads and compare the data sets. So this is what we did, and, and actually on, on the right side here, you see a kind of ROC curve uh, showing the specificity and the sensitivity of the circuit variation face facing using, uh, using this nanopore data, and I think it, it looks, looks very good already without, uh, without much tweaking. So a final question that we had is uh, related to the chromotripsis again, and that is, can we now, based on these nanopore data, tell whether the chromotripsis that occurred de novo in this kit, whether it happened on chromosomes that the kit inherited from the father, or did it happen on chromosomes that the kit inherited from the mother? And actually, just from Illumina data, this is very difficult to figure out. You need to be lucky that the reads that bridge these structural variation breakpoints, the de novo breakpoints of the chromotripsis in this case, um, hit a phase informative SNP, but with the longer reads from the nanopore, uh, this should be uh, much, more, uh, much more easy. And we were encouraged by the phasing results that I just showed you to also phase these de novo breakpoints as well in the kit. Um, so the result of this process is this plot. And actually here on the, on the left si side you see uh, those de novo breakpoints, 40 in total here. And here on the left side, those are the reads that span these breakpoints. So those are really the discordant reads, the split reads that span the chromotripsis breakpoints. So the different colors indicate whether these reads, and these are the numbers of reads for each of these 40 breakpoints here, whether, the, whether these reads are derived from the father, uh, whether they're derived from the mother, or whether it's unclear from which uh, both, both of the uh, parents they are derived from. So you can clearly see that all the reads, the discordant reads, the split reads here that cover these 40 breakpoints uh, are all derived uh, from the father here. And actually the opposite is true for the reads that span the same uh, genomic coordinates but are not split mapped and basically point to the alternative allele. So this was really a black and white picture and an answer, a biological question actually that we could beautifully answer now with these uh, very long uh, nanopore reads that we obtained for this uh, human sample. So with that, I would like to end and uh, thank the many people involved in this project. So it has been uh, quite an adventure, I should say, both on the level of generating the data as well as on the bioinformatics side. Uh, so many people from the UMC in Utrecht, where I'm working, uh, are involved. Uh, also some other people from uh, collaborators, which provided uh, access to samples um, or help with bioinformatic data analysis. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Wigger. Do we have any questions? Oh, we've got one over here. Your uh, tools, so the nano SV tools, will be, uh, uh, I mean, adapted for the RNA-seq analysis in order to detect all the uh, splicing events? It should be, I think, fairly straightforward to detect uh, splice variants uh, based on, on cDNA or uh, cDNA data indeed, I think. Uh, yes, I think the last mapping splits reads in, in multiple different segments that map at different locations, uh, so it should be straightforward to pick this up uh, from those data, yes. Um, in your last and the nano SV, do you use both the 1D and 2D reads, or you only use the 2D reads in, in SV calling? Yeah, in the end, we decided actually to combine all the data, even even some crappy reads that actually failed, uh, some base calling filters. We ended up using them all uh, to reach the 16x coverage. So on the combined data set, including 1D, 2D reads, uh, we, we did the analysis. So yeah, both three types are represented in the data indeed. And, and, and actually, we find also that many of the breakpoints are supported by both three types. I yes. see. And then when you compare the call between your Nano SV and Lumpy or in other program, what do you think the major um, the major differences that make the call looks very different? You mean what is the difference or what is the reason why we don't pick yeah. up all the calls yeah. by another caller, for example? Like where, why the certain SV only called in your program but not the other? What's the major? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point. I, we didn't systematically look into this. I know that Lumpy had a lot of trouble calling circuit variations at all from the nanopore data. So most of them were just reported as candidates, could not even be genotyped uh, from the data. Um, so I think this tool is not so much suited with, with these very long error-prone reads. For the sniffles, I don't know. I, I mean, 
I, I do not have much insight in this tool. It was, it was uh, taken from GitHub and basically we tested different settings and tried to optimize it <coughs> and find as many breakpoints uh, back as we could uh, possibly find. Uh, we didn't look specifically in the breakpoints that were missed by this tool uh, compared to our own tool. Uh, so I think this is a, certainly a good suggestion to, uh, to take a look into, yes. One more at the back, I think. Okay. When you compare your uh, SP caller with other uh, SP callers, you pick up the 20 base pair. Why you pick up uh, select uh, this cutoff? You so could you repeat it again? Uh, when your slide showed the structure variation, yes. compare different uh, SP callers, you select a cutoff larger than 20 base pair. Yes. Why you pick up the, this cutoff? Um. Well, I think the, uh, one of the main reasons why we, where we set a, a certain cutoff in terms of size is that not all col colors had the same size range of circuit variation that they could capture. And, and using this cutoff of 20 base pairs, we could make a fair comparison between the different colors. Yeah. Your last slide, that was all from one individual. Uh, the chromothripsis yeah, attributed to the father. That's correct, yes. Do you, would you like to make a prediction whether that will be universal? Uh, like whether chromatips in all case will be from father? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. So in the past, we have sequenced many of, of these chromatriptic genomes already, like that occurred de novo in these children with, with like ment mental retardation or other kinds of congenital diseases uh, using Illumina sequencing. Um, so, well, I mean, as is clear that with these short reads, it's difficult to find out whether the, the breaks, the no break would happen on father monochromosomes. But in, in, in some cases, we observe deletions, like segments that were, were not reassembled into these rearranged chromosomes. And these deleted, we looked into these deleted regions, whether the uh, allele that is remaining was from father and mother. And actually, in all cases where we could do this, uh, always the father chromosome appeared affected. So, I think there is some consensus there, and, and, and we can really state that, well, at least in the majority of cases, uh, this is indeed from father, yes. As far as these rearranged events are concerned, mm -hmm. you should be able to visualize both normal and rearranged mm -hmm. events, because both the homologs may not rearrange. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, from the data that we have right now, at least from the chromotypes, we see that only one of the two um, alleles, or haplotypes, so to say, I is affected. So the other is, uh, is normal. So there we don't find any breakpoints in this case. Thank you so much, Vigar. Thank much. you.